Hello, Nana here. Welcome back to TS100. So, let's continue our series on the image related puzzles with the exposure mask viewer. This one is a slightly more complicated one. It, it's actually a bit more complicated than the previous one, but that's also what makes it pretty fun to do. So, let's dive into this solution first. So, um, might look complicated, but this one, this one, and this one, and this one are only comments. There's only four nodes here with code, so don't don't worry too much. I'll explain everything. So, what's an exposure mask viewer? This is the first puzzle where we will transform data into an image. So we get a series of four numbers that we will be uh, that we will receive in sequence. So the first one will be an x value, second one will be a, f a y value, the third one will be the width, and the th fourth one will be a height. So, for example, uh, this being the first one, we will get the x coordinate. So how mu how much it is off from the left side? Then we get the y coordinate. So that's how much it's off from the top. Then we will get the width. So that's how wide this uh, rectangle is going to be. And then we get the height. So how tall this rectangle is going to be. And then it's up to us to actually program to write the program that will send out the color coordinates that paints the image this way. So what I've come up with is a system that basically stores each of the relevant values in one of these three nodes. So the first one stores X, second one stores W, last one stores Y. And the final node passes X and Y straight through. And on the W, it will um, do a countdown in order. Basically, it will draw the line. So you can look at the last node as a node that will receive the X and the Y coordinates and will just pass it straight to the, to the image. Because in order to draw an image, we need an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, a series of color numbers, and a negative one to close it off, or a negative number to close it off. So in this case, X and Y, we get from the pipeline on the left. And with the W, we actually do something because it basically means how often we have to repeat the color. And because the color is always white, we know that we can send out color code number three, which stands for white. So we can always send that one out. So all we have to concern ourselves with is counting down for the width. So we get a width, we store it in an accumulator. And we send the number down. We send the number out, I mean. So that's going to be one white square. Then we subtract one. And as long as the, the remaining number is greater than zero, we just jump back and we loop again and again and again and again until the number goes below zero. And then we fall through and we send out negative one <coughs> and we loop back. And we start waiting again for an X coordinate. So this is a, a pretty simple painter node. The most of the complicated logic is on the left side. But again, here, there is a pattern that I'm repeating a couple times. So let's start at the beginning. So the first node. I mean, I've made annotations on the sites actually that explain what they do as well, just to keep the logic straight. Because this is actually a uh, version 2.6, so this is about the uh, fourth, ninth iteration. Yeah, this is my ninth iteration. I, I had a lot of fun just optimizing this one. I started out with using eight nodes, and I've managed to get it down all the way to four in order to get a reasonably optimized and pretty concise solution. All solutions afterwards are more complicated. So the first one, this is where we have the input. So this gets all four of the numbers in order. So we get the X, which we store. So we put it in the accumulator. Then we swap because we also store the height in here, but we don't get the height just yet. But so then next up we get a Y and a W, which both pass straight down. 
Afterwards, we store the H, the, the height value in the accumulator. So at this point, after this has been executed, H is in the accumulator, the height, and the X coordinate is stored in buck because we swapped them out. So next up, we loop. This is a loop we keep repeating. So then we swap. So we put X that used to be in buck, we put it back. Then we send the X value straight down. Now we swap again to get to the height value, the h, which will then be in arc. And we subtract one. And if it's not a zero, we look back. So in this case, we start out with a positive height. Every time we send out the x value, we subtract one and we check if it's zero. As long as it's not zero, we keep repeating that. So if the height u is four initially, we send out I, uh, x. Subtract one, it's three, that's not zero. So we repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. We repeat it four times. Height is four, we repeat it four times until here finally our number has counted down to zero. After which we send a value of zero down to indicate to the rest of the nodes that we are done. So this keeps emitting axis and the height is something that basically we need to paint one line for every height. So in this case, a height is a countdown. We only need it to count down. We never need the actual height value. So we can we can afford to store it in a countdown until it's gone. There's no need to do anything else with it. But th th this is the, 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 the trick that I use here. I just keep sending out the same values a uh, limited number of times. So let's look at the next node. This one has multiple functions. It has to store the width and it also has to process values from that it gets from up because it's going to receive access every loop and it might receive a zero instead of an X value if we're actually done. And if you look carefully at the picture, you see that X is never zero. There's one black line on the outside. And that, that's actually a bit of information that we can use because X is never a uh, never zero as a legitimate value. We can use zero as a control value. Otherwise we would have had to use negative one or something such, something like that. Okay, so what we do, uh, just like here, when we have a setup, when the initial uh, burst of values come up, we have to pass a couple of true. So if you remember here, uh, X we stored, we didn't pass it down. Then Y and W are passed down. So our middle node needs to do something with it. In this case, the Y value, it doesn't care about because that's the domain of the bottom node. But the W value, the middle node cares about. So that's one we store in the accumulator. And again, we swap around. So that the accumulator is ready to receive a temporary value, which is either X or zero. And that's for, just for signal processing of the loop value here. So afterwards we fall through. So we take the value from up, we store it in the accumulator, which is the temporary value. And then we send the value straight down. Because if, either, either if it's X, then uh, it needs to be passed because we need to send the X scale coordinate out. But if it's zero, the bottom node needs to know about it. So as a control value, we can just pass it through as well. And afterwards we check if it's equal to zero, we jump back to the setup. Because after this zero, it, this is gonna fall through as well. And it's gonna read the, the X, Y, W and H values from the loop. So that there, they all have a similar flow in that regard. So. If we don't have a zero, that means we actually got an X coordinate, which we sent down. So we need to prepare to also do something with the W, which we have stored. So we swap out the W that used to be in, in the buck value and the temporary value was ACK. We swap them around so we can actually read the W from ACK and we send it down. And afterwards we swap them again so that when we jump back to the loop here, we are ready to receive the temporary value in ACK and W is still stored in buck. Okay. So at this point, we have set up a bunch of numbers. Um, we have a means to uh, iterate through the number of lines. And here we have something that will send out, say, pass the, the X value through. It passes the Y value through. 
and every time we go through we will send x down because it's stored up here and we will send the w value down so this one will receive two values from upstairs the initially uh, in the loop it will receive two values but initially it will receive the y value because that's basically all that trickles down during the setup so in this case we move it up we store it in ACK and we swap again it's the same pattern we keep the value we care about in buck so that we can receive a temporary value in ACK which is either something we have to pass through or it is a zero that indicates we have to reset so after we have set up we fall through to the check loop and so we take the value put it in ACK if it's equal to zero we are done, or then we fall back to the setup and we await another Y value. If it's not equal to zero, it means we actually have data. So in that regards, we first get the X value, which is passed through all the way from the top node straight down through here, and we send it to the right. Because this is the first value we want, the X. So then afterwards we swap around. So the buck value, which holds a Y, we swap it around. So we can read it and we can send it to the right. Afterwards, we take the W value that's being delivered by the middle node, down, uh, and we take it the from up and we send it to the right as well. So then the middle node or the, the output node can store the W in the ACK and do its own countdown. Parallel to that, we add one to the Y value that's stored in ACK. Why do we do that? Well, if you remember, this is the x-coordinate, this is the y-coordinate. Um, every time we, pa we complete a line, because basically what we did here, we passed through an x, we passed through a y, and we passed through a width. That's all this one needs to paint an entire line. So we need to advance to the next line. Remember, this one counts down how many lines we still have to go. But every time, every new line, we have to increase the y-coordinate by one because every lower line has a y-coordinate that's one higher than the one above it. So we need to increase the y-coordinate and we swap it back into buck so we are ready to receive a temp value in our accumulator after which we ju jump back to the check and we await further instructions. So if we just see this slowly in action, you see it slowly painting the lines one by one by one. And if I just advance this a bit quicker, you'll see that this one runs in 887 cycles using four nodes and 39 instructions. Instructions wise, it's, it's to the left of the most popular peak. Um, I need to get 38 or 37 instructions to further optimize this. That's going to be pretty tricky. So uh, every line does something useful. So that's gonna be pretty darn hard, actually. But I have found a way to improve the cycle count by a little bit. And how I did that was by using multiple nodes. So this is the latest in a series of attempts at improving this puzzle. And if you look, I mean, I, I try to keep a, a log of scores I've achieved in the past. And every time I make some changes and run the puzzle, I write down the score. So then this way I I can you know, track for myself if I'm improving and how much I'm improving. And if I've achieved better scores before. So in this case... 2.6 is the previous one I showed you. That's 887 cycles with four nodes. So I was like, okay, there's three nodes here. They're doing multiple things. So they're swapping values in and out. They have both the ACK and the buck that they use. So there is some inefficiency in swapping between those values all the time. Also, this one was counting down. The Y value here was counting up. We had the X and the H value here. The H value was actually counting down as well every cycle. And let's see, X, H, and we had the W that was stored here that was also being swapped in and out and passed through so we could do a countdown here. 
So I figured, well, let's get some logic out and see if we can spread things around a little bit so that there's less waiting and blocking. And eventually I settled on this. So the biggest change is that this one is now only responsible for the Y coordinate. It's not actually passing any data through. So if you look at the, the output node, it gets the X coordinate from here, it gets the Y coordinate from here, and it gets the W from the right hand side. So every adjacent node is only responsible for delivering one point of data. Not multiple, just one. So these two nodes and this one are basically just for passing data through. This one, it actually doesn't do anything except for pass data through and there there is some decision logic because it needs to know whether the other nodes are going to do a setup or not so let me explain uh, as with the previous solution, I have a setup step and I've got a loop step. So the setup is when we read all the data from in and then it's just delivered to all the nodes. So once again, we get all the data from up here and we deliver it downstairs. So we send Y and W out. X and H are retained in this node. Okay. So Y and W, Y is just sent straight down. W is sent to the right because W is now stored in here. That means we need to actually do something useful with it. So it's stand over here. So this node now in its setup step, it needs to pass the W value from the left to the right because it needs to end up here. In here, all we get is the Y coordinate, so we store it. Okay, so then the main loop. We send out the X value we subtract the h value. So all we do is send down x. The moment it reaches zero, we are done. So that's still the same as before. The thing is we have to handle it differently. So in here, the value that comes from upstairs, it needs to be sent both down and to the right. So we put it in the accumulator and then we send it first to the right and then downstairs. Y first to the right, because this one delivers X, and this is the this one is, is blocking until we get X. Also, it needs to pass the value further down to the right, so there's a bit more overhead in, in communication on the right-hand side, so it's more efficient to actually send it there first. So, what we do here, we take the value from the left, put it in the accumulator, if it's equal to zero, we're done. We move back to the setup step, because we don't retain any local state, I mean, the x value we get from the left and we pass it straight down. The, this one, it will actually either get a value or it will process the value, but there are no control signals. There's only one value and there, that's it. It manages its own storage. So there's no need to reset it. Just the fact that it will get a new value that's not zero will mean... Um, it, it will reset itself. So that's pretty efficient. After that, it sends a zero to the right, which is in this case the control signal that this one needs to know that it uh, can process the next value. And afterwards, it will queue up the accumulated value down. I sent the zero to the right first because there is some communication uh, involved uh, over here. And there's an intermediary node that can actually hold a value. So I send out the zero, it will always be picked up by this one. And then this one will always wait patiently until the bottom node is done to receive the value. So this is not a blocking operation, which is very nice. That's, that's if you have the opportunity to optimize things by spreading out some nodes, just putting a, a empty node in between or a node, node with a single move instruction in between two busy nodes oftentimes improves communication because they are no longer waiting for each other because the intermediary node does all the waiting. So a move instruction is not a, an instruction that will become blocking. So that's very, very useful in, in general as a optimization tip. 
So we send out the control value. We send the we queue up the X for delivery. Okay, so the next up we care about the Y value. So let's jump back. We after we send the X value to the right, we also send the X value downstairs. So here, once again, take the X value from up, put it in the accumulator. If it's equal to zero, we know it was not actually an X coordinate. We know it was a control signal that we need to reset. So we jump to the setup step and we wait for a new Y value. If it's not a zero, we can actually do something. So in this case, we swap out uh, the Y value that we store in back, put it into arc, we send it to the right, and then we increase it by one to basically make the pointer move to the next line. So we're ready for when we are called next. After which we swap the Y value back into the back. So arc is once again just a temp value. And then we jump to the check and we wait for a new instruction. And this one, it's, it spends most of its time just waiting for new instructions. It doesn't really do a lot. So this one will queue up the Y value to move to the right. So this one can pick it up when it's ready. So last but not least, a dedicated node for storing and passing through W values. And this used to actually do the countdown as well. But turns out it's as many instructions doing the countdown in here as it would be in here. This one is... No, that there's no speed up from actually doing it there. Actually, there's a speed, there, there's a slowdown because if all you do is just pass the W value through to here, then this one can do all the counting down and it never has to wait for the next value from the right hand side. So it's spending less time in blocking actions, more time just spinning stuff through and sending stuff down. So that actually managed to get me from 896 down to 850 cycles. So turns out this doing the logic in here is more efficient. I'm very curious if it's possible to actually do outsource all the, the logic for lining up the sequence somewhere else. Because there's no other, that, that's, the, that's the only thing that's left to actually further improve this. Ideally, this, this node would be a move any down. That would be the ideal case. Because then there's only one instruction that just repeats an uh, infinite number of times. And then the surrounding nodes are responsible for sending through things like the x-coordinates, y-coordinates, and the color codes. But the thing is then you have to coordinate all the other nodes which is tricky by itself. So for now, this is it. Oh, I was gonna go into the, the, the bit of the logic here. So what we do here, where we get a value, any value, we are checking. So we put it in the accumulator. If it's equal to zero, we know we have to send out the value we've stored before. If it's not equal to zero, we have to store the value. So in that case, we save it. So that copies the ACK value to back and then they will be both identical, after which we jump back to the check. Very important, I made the mistake of not doing that the first time. If you store the value, it doesn't mean we actually draw a line. It doesn't mean we uh, have counted down and anything. So if you don't have to jump in here and just fall through to just basically giving the order to draw the next line, you're gonna uh, get into trouble because you're trying to draw too many lines and things will get out of sync really, really fast so that's why you jump back so the moment you get a zero we just jump to next which after which we swap out because remember we use arc as a temp back for storage so we swap them so our stored w value is an arc after which we uh, send the arc value to the left and then we swap it back into back for storage and i just realized i no longer need this label even though it used to be there before and if we run this really quickly, you'll see 850 cycles using seven nodes and 48 instructions. And this seems to be one of the most popular solutions uh, in terms of cycle count. So, yeah, there you have it. 
everything I know so far about the Exposure Mask Viewer. As always, if you have tips, tricks, uh, better solutions, uh, ideas, uh, please leave a comment below. I like to, to read them and other people that watch these videos might also want to know if there's a better way to do things, a faster way to do things and so forth. And with that, I thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next time when we look at the histogram viewer, which is also very fun. So, bye bye.